Thank you, Tony. That was uh, very well put. Uh, I quite appreciate the way you have gone through the analyzing the problem and finding a solution. I hope the participants will take away the message that there is help available in this very difficult group of patients. Uh, and I have no doubt when you eventually put your data together, I'm sure you will find that there is a survival benefit. Okay, now I'd like to welcome uh, Professor Peng and uh, Tony uh, to address some of the questions that have been, been coming fast and furious. We are also running a little bit behind schedule, but maybe we can leave 15 minutes for the discussion. Okay, Christine, over to you. And so the first question is directed to both Professor Peng and also Dr. Wu. So it's from Dr. Zhang Zhang. So consider the versatility uh, of the Peng block. Would you uh, to encourage Peng block to be incorporated as part of the enhanced recovery program in all hip fractures patients? Um, for me, I well, it really depends on the, the facilities, what you have and the resource you have. For me, I think it makes sense. So think about this. So I, I don't know in Asia, but in typically in North America, so someone who have a hip fracture, they go to the eMERGE. And then so it's typical in North America because of some mandate because of the mortality data. Um, the hospital are obliged to operate within two days, uh, no more than three days, but optimal within two days. So what will happen is in an eMERGE, uh, typically, now, we, once they are in, in an immersion, they activate their pink surface. So the pink surface will go down. And while they are waiting for the surgery, um, they, have, they usually receive a lot of IV hydromorphone or morphine. And then they make them drowsy, they may aspirate while waiting for surgery. So typically, they activate active pink surface, go there. So they call us, the regional team, and do the, uh, uh, the, the block, uh, mostly pink, pink block, and so that they can start to turn or even sit up a little bit so that they when they drink they don't aspirate so and, and then they will have a surgery within the next uh, 24 hours or so this pathway will be for humane reason is more most humane for mortality and we don't have a mortality data but at least they can uh, sit up a little bit so that they don't choke and aspirate and uh, and so that and they don't need to be drugged up with all the IV morphine before the surgery so it makes a lot of sense so this is a pathway that uh, our hospital are working and we want to look at the data. Uh, but this is actually, I, I think it's very uh, reasonable for, uh, in the system in North America, but I, I, I don't know enough about in Asia. So yes, the answer is yes. Um, yeah, thank you, um, Popan. Um, I fully agree with Popan. Um, in Hong Kong, so I know the situation more clearly here. So I, I think nowadays our emergency physicians are, are also quite enthusiastic in learning some ultrasound technique. So in terms of the um, enhanced recovery program, we, we actually um, hope that in future, um, some emergency physician can actually do this block because pen block is quite um, simple without too much risk. And um, the landmark is quite clear and reproduci reproducible. So they can give an injection and then we can do the surgery within um, 48 hours. And post-operatively, my thought is, um, although we can still adopt multimodal analgesia in this group of patients, but think about their comorbidities. Many of them are frail, not to mention about opioid, but even NSAID, um, say 90 year or 100 year old, they go for surgery. Um, even you can still prescribe NSAID what you can give is just a low dose, but not a high dose. Um, Panadol, some of them would be also conservative, not to give four gram, but just three gram per day. So with this combination of multimodal analgesia and with a bone surgery, okay, there are a lot of drilling and trimming of the bone cortex and actually quite painful. Um, um, and that's why with the incorporation of this uh, pen block, um, I think that will have a lot of help in this group of patients. But again, um, um, that would require some um, education to our anesthetists in Hong Kong um, so that they have this uh, technique and also there's a mentality. Okay. I think uh, there is no denying that given the simplicity, it is something that should be incorporated. 
But given uh, the resource implication, I think this is where the bean counters have to be really put into the fray. Even in North America, I'm sure uh, it does not become a standard of care. Uh, given its simplicity and how uh, much uh, uh, discomfort these patients face, although the mandate is now to operate them within 24 hours, I wish the mandate would say that they should be made pain-free within an hour of their arrival to the operating uh, to the hospital. Uh, yes, you can operate within 24 hours, but as Tony alluded to, uh, when we are in the wards and we are running around doing our other uh, errands, we can often know which is a hip fracture screaming away because they are very typically uh, associated with the movement and care. So I think uh, I think uh, this is a good discussion, and I have uh, no doubt that this is a positive step, uh, and it will it will become reality in the near future, uh, in um, probably in more developed countries first, and then in the in in the average population. Yes, next, Christine. Okay, so uh, the next question is uh, directed to. Uh, Dr. Tony Ng. So the audience are quite interested in the neurolysis. So um, um, Dr. Rajendra Sahu would like to have a recap on how much alcohol do you inject for each nerve block. And also uh, Dr. Muthukuma would like to know, uh, are you worried about uh, absolute alcohol will cause injuries to other uh, surrounding organs, for example, ischemia of the head of femur? Oh, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Rajendra. Hi, nice to meet you. Um, and um, to recap, the alcohol ingestion has to be kept as low as possible. Um, the dose we use, the water we use usually is around four to three to five mil for depend um, on praying. And then we inject another three mil to the ileal psoas praying. And lastly is one to 1.5 mil to the operator Love articular branch. We give a local anesthetic first, and then and then we give the same volume of uh, um, absolute alcohol so that the ratio is around one to one. And then to um, respond to Moda, um, nice to meet you again. Um, and in fact, there's uh, some weeks to for the little agent that can um, injure the surrounding tissue, like those uh, if you see. The video just shared by Professor Pan um, in the la in the second talk. You see some injectic can actually go retrograde through the little trajectory, and that would actually be the um, location where the iliosaurus muscle is located. So if um, um, your injector is too much, the more alcohol that would um, track back to the trajectory, then there's a more chance that there's an irritation to the iliosaurus. Um, there's a possibility of that. Um, but for the um, irritation to the femoral head, right, Christine? Yes. Irrit um, I, I never have encountered any single case of this. Unless, unless you, you, you inject your, your injector intra-articularly because you puncture too much um, into the joint instead of pericapsularly, then there will be a risk of uh, um, intra-articular alcohol and that would cause a fibrosis um, in long run. Can I just add a point? So, um, you know, Tony is a very complicated thinker. So the, the, the step he, he, he has done for each dose is so meticulous. I don't know the, the one who, who cannot understand the dose. Uh, uh, when we submit the journal, the, the reviewer cannot understand as well. So <laughs> just go to our APM journal. There is a summary table to, do, to, 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 to list exactly what dose, what volume we use uh, for those. So uh, you'll follow. I think the, 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 the person who asked this question asked about, does it jeopardize the muscular supply? Um, many years ago, uh, uh, one, one third of a century ago, I was a surgeon. So we know the muscular supply, um, they, are, they are from the medial lateral uh, collect, uh, uh, circumflex artery and something from the ligament and terrace. So they are all extra capsular and reflect inside the head and neck. So when, he, when, we, when, when, when we do the pericapsular uh, block for the for those uh, alcohol, the low anesthetic spread along the capsule plane. They will not, if unless you inject a high volume, they may, may not uh, expand all the way to extra capsule, which you will meet the circumflex artery. So, in in general, I would say the the chemical will not damage the muscular supply unless you inject high volume, which we are not advocating. 
Uh, Christine, since we are running out of time and we are slightly behind schedule, can I say uh, you pick the last lucky question and then we call it a day? Uh, I'm sure this the, the participants can get in touch with the speakers and uh, post the questions later. Okay. okay. Let's see what's the lucky question for uh, from Christine. Uh, so we have an inspiring question here. So a lot about acute hip pressures, but for uh, OA hip. So some of the audience would like to know: is there any um, is there any um, way to manage patients with OA hip who doesn't want to go to surgery with any kind of regional anesthesia? Um, well, Tony can add, but basically this is what the PEMPOT was initially developed for. So we have been doing this, so yes, when someone who are not going to have a surgery or medically not fit for surgery, we can do ablation. Ablation can be in radio frequency ablation or alcohol ablation. So I have been doing a, a radio frequency ablation. I use probably three to four needles um, and on the anterior capsule to provide a stipulation if they have mostly the weight bearing collapse. So if they have a complete collapse and a complete destruction of the hip, then I will add the optimator for the radio frequency ablation. I tend to use more alcohol now because it's much faster, much easier. And um, one of my population, subcompetent population is the ABM, the, the sickle cell and or for steroid related uh, avascular necrosis. Uh, but we, 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 we MRI them and if the uh, if they are probably less than 50% necrosis and is mainly in the weight bearing part, they are the good prognostic group. So we do alcohol phenolysis so quick, they are mostly young patient and uh, it just do the job. Uh, and, and so that are the group that I usually do alcohol. Um, okay, one thank more you. Uh, oh, sorry, uh, go ahead, Tony. Yeah, just one more comment about those uh, OA hip. Apart from uh, you use uh, radio frequency or alcohol neolysis to treat the joint, don't forget those uh, extra articular uh, component, which is uh, would be secondary to the OA hip uh, development. And then the patient, even you just treat the joint, if you miss those extra articular component, the patient will still um, complain of pain. So, so do you remember handle those problems like those uh, gluteal muscle piriformis and also the idle so as uh, muscle tendon? Thank you, uh, Tony. Thank you, Philip. Uh, also, thanks to the previous speakers, Professor Ko and uh, Chris Vermeulen. Thank you, Christine, for uh, being with us all this evening. Uh, it's been a great, uh, great session. It was surely a variety of um, of uh, of uh, pain and uh, region anesthesia. After all, as I say, variety is the spice of life. It has surely given us uh, a lot of food for thought, and hopefully, it will change uh, practices around the world. Uh, at the end, uh, I, I envision it will improve patient care and quality. So uh, to all you participants, thank you for joining us. Uh, all the speakers, once again, thank you for sparing your time uh, and hope to see you soon and stay safe and stay healthy wherever you are. Take care and bye-bye for thank now you. until we see you again. Take care. Thank you. Thank you.